How's it going everyone, Taki here. Today we're gonna to take a look at a very interesting piece of tech and one that is easily the smallest x86 computer that I've ever held in my hands. This is the Lark Box from Chewy, which they are describing as the world's smallest 4K mini PC, and it seems to fit that bill thanks to a combination of a souped up Atom processor and a fairly decent GPU. We'll get more into that last one in a bit, but first I wanna quickly show what this looks like in the hand because I think a small portion of the value you get from buying this comes from the novelty of its size. I have tested some other Atom-based mini PCs before and performance can be all over the place, but this thing comes with six gigabytes of RAM and that should open up enough doors to make this thing actually useful in real world situations. Before we get into that, let's do a teardown because I'm dying to see how they crammed all of this into this tiny box. If you flip the device over to the back, you'll see that this has mounting holes if you wanted to mount this on the back of a TV or a monitor, but I plan on just letting this sit flat on a surface because it hardly takes up any space at all. Once we remove the first plate, we have access to the SSD slot. I don't plan on using this at all since this device ships with 128 gigabytes of internal storage, which is more than enough for my needs, but this is what it looks like with an SSD installed in this bottom portion. With four more screws out, we have access to the bottom PCB plate that houses our dual USB 3.0 ports. This PCB is connected to the main board with thin ribbon cables that are very reminiscent of the ones that are used in cell phones. If I flip this over, you can see the CMOS battery, the SD card slot, the headphone jack, and two USB ports. I still don't see the CPU, so we're gonna need to remove the last PCB from the shell. At this point, the heatsink can easily be pulled off gently to protect the wires, and we can finally see the new J4115 CPU, which seems to be identical to the J4105 CPU. Here's a shot of the two boards side by side so you can see the scale. Now that I've finished taking this apart, I have to say that it's pretty awesome how they were able to make these two chips operate in tandem in a vertical case to cut down on the footprint of the device. The only thing left here is to take off the heatsink from the top of the case to get a look at that fan. I will say that this metal plate is pretty beefy and it's easily half the weight of the entire computer. I do just want to also say that the fan is audible when you're using it, but I do plan on trying to make this passively cooled in the future to cut down on the noise. Now that I've got the device assembled again, I want to see how far I can push this little Lark box. I've only tested two other Celeron processors in this generation before, but those devices were portable computers, so I'm interested to see how this little thing will perform. The gaming benchmarks are probably going to speak for themselves, but I did want to run Cinebench R20 and Geekbench for my own records. This device has a Cinebench score of 385 and a fairly decent Geekbench 4 score of 1792 and 4555. Let's kick things off with NES with the new 3D Send Steam app that launched this month. Just as a reminder, you can find the names to any of the games tested in the description box below. You can also see CPU and GPU metrics on the left side of your screen throughout this video. All of the footage that you see in this video is captured at 1080p using an Elgato capture device on a separate computer. Because I started with NES, I thought I would just throw an SNES using the BSNES HD core and I think it looks absolutely amazing on this computer. Moving on up to N64 and GoldenEye is running very well but there is some occasional lag here and there. PS1 fares much better than N64 on this device while also consuming less power. Thank you. 
It's not really surprising because we do have a decent GPU, but Dreamcast with the ReDream emulator performs very well. With the exception of God of War, all of the PSP games that you'll see in this section were rendered at 1080p with the Vulcan backend. GameCube is really where I started to see the first weaknesses of this device, with glitched audio and occasional stuttering in some of the games that I tested. For PS2, I changed the preset profile only when I couldn't get decent performance from a game using the safe setting. For God of War, I basically enabled every hack possible, and while the game does play, it's not enjoyable. I only tested one 3DS game on video because I wasn't happy with the performance, but I'll look into testing the system again when I get around to updating my Citra build.
This is Breath of the Wild at 360p, which I would say is playable, but I don't have any shader cache built. This game runs at 20 FPS in areas where the cache is already built, and the only downside seems to be that async shader cache doesn't seem possible on this chip. Finally, let's finish things off with Steam running Devil May Cry on low settings. I've tested a lot of Steam games and Devil May Cry is always one of the ones that I benchmark and if this game runs, a lot of other games that are less demanding are going to run much better. Now that I've finished off the emulation tests, I have to say that this little PC is a fairly capable retro emulation system. I don't know how many people would use it for gaming, but it is very capable. I'm still undecided of how I'll even use this device now that this video is done, or if I'll even stick with Windows on it or not. I'm thinking about turning this into a media center for my living room PC, and I'll probably end up keeping some of the lower end retro systems installed on this device to play occasionally. I'm interested to know though, how would you use this little computer if you owned it? Do you like the device? Do you hate it? Leave your thoughts below. I want to say thanks again for taking the time to watch this video. Happy gaming, everyone. Talk you out.